You know how I tell you folks that I'm going to try to make you the smartest person in the room involving the Second Amendment, no matter who else is in that room? Well, this is one of those videos that's going to do that exact thing. I will make you smarter than anybody else in the room in terms of the high-level strategic thinking that is going on with the chess match involving the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeal and the so-called assault weapon ban and magazine ban in the state of Illinois. You're not going to want to miss this, including the historical reality of what I'm about to tell you. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of the Four Box of Diner, proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and author of the brand new best-selling book, Disarmed, What the Ukraine War Teaches Americans About the Right to Bear Arms. Check that out because there's a lot of lessons for Americans involving what's going on in Ukraine. Okay, folks, so we got to get a little geeky here, and I'm going to give you some really important history, but this is a very important video for you to understand the chess match that's going on involving the anti-gunner strategy associated with how they're going to deal with the pending assault weapon ban case, the magazine ban case. We all know assault weapons is a propaganda term for semi-automatic rifles. I want to talk about this because I'm, then I'm going to show you the historical approach that the anti-gun movement has generally applied to these kinds of cases involving Supreme Court strategy before you get to the Supreme Court. So, quick reminder. We have two cases right now that are on path for the Supreme Court. One is technically there. You have the Barnett versus Rao case, which is in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, that has been consolidated with the Bevis versus City of Naperville case. Sometimes that case is referred to as the National Association for Gun Rights versus Naperville. Those two cases have now been consolidated together in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals based in Chicago, Illinois. They both deal with whether or not the so-called assault weapon ban and the magazine ban enacted by Illinois are constitutional under the Second Amendment. As a side note, the National Association for Gun Rights sought an emergency injunction from the United States Supreme Court, specifically to the judge assigned to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. That's Judge Amy Coney Barrett. That is pending there. The lawyers for the other case, the Barnett versus Rao case, submitted an amicus brief in support of the National Association for Gun Rights case to the Supreme Court. And that amicus brief written by Paul Clement and Aaron Murphy basically say that Judge Stephen McGlynn of the Southern District of Illinois has enjoined the Illinois law and the U.S. Supreme Court should basically do the same because it's clearly unconstitutional and that's where we stand. Now, so with that articulation of where the chess pieces are on the board, I want to talk to you about what's going to happen. Now, just yesterday, we had breaking news that the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals got scared that the United States Supreme Court was going to rush out an opinion and spank them for doing a bad job and or not doing their job. So the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, including the lead judge there, Judge Frank Easterbrook, rushed out an order on Friday afternoon to try to head that Supreme Court spanking off at the pass. And they did that by issuing an expedited briefing schedule, which I know is not fast in our minds, but in the world of federal court cases, it's extremely fast, okay? And as a result of that, I think that has dramatically reduced the chances that the U.S. Supreme Court is going to intervene because now it shows that the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals is going to hear the appeals involving these uh, gun bans in the next five or six weeks. So that's significant. Now, the point of today's video is the I want you to understand how the anti-gun movement is thinking about this case and the different directions it's going to go. Because the one thing I pride myself on this Four Boxes Diner Second Amendment channel is I don't just tell you what I read in the news this morning and just talk about it. I also try to tell you, so you are the smartest person in the room, how to look down the chessboard as to what's going to happen and how to think about it so you become the smartest person in the room. So that's what I'm about to do here. Now, here is what's going to happen. There are three judges, a three-judge panel is going to hear these consolidated cases of the National Association of Gun Rights case, which came out of Chicago, federal court in Chicago, and the Barnett versus Rao case, which came out of the Southern District of Illinois. Those cases have been consolidated. The Seventh Circuit's going to hear a case, and they're going to hear those arguments together at the end of June. As a reminder, the three-judge panel that entered the stay of Judge McGlynn's order 
that right, Judge McGlynn in the Southern District had enjoined the gun laws, rightly so in my view. The Seventh Circuit stated initially with a single judge, Judge Easterbrook, and then on Friday, a three-judge panel of Frank Easterbrook, Diane Wood, and Michael Brennan. Uh, the three of them continued the Easterbrook thing where they continued the stay of the McGlynn order, which is unfortunate because that means the gun control laws continue in effect, but they did make the briefing schedule very fast, so that part is good. Now, here is what is going to happen in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. The first thing that's going to happen is there will be a three-judge panel assigned to hear the argument at the end of June. Now, that three-judge panel is not necessarily the same three judges of Easterbrook, Wood, and Brennan that just entered that order yesterday. Because yesterday's panel was an administrative panel, and then you have a merits panel to hear the case on the merits. And they're not necessarily the same. In fact, usually they're not the same panel. However, if you look at the internal operating procedures of the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, there's an exception that says that where a three-judge administrative panel, which in this case, Easterbrook, Wood, and Brennan, where there's an administrative decision to expedite a case and the hearing of that case, it is allowed for that three-judge panel that entered that expedited briefing schedule to sit as the panel for the merits of that case. So if you look at the internal operating procedures for the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, there is a reasonably good chance that the merit panel who's going to hear this case and decide whether or not robustly it violates the Second Amendment of these Illinois gun laws could be the same panel that we saw yesterday of Easterbrook, Wood, and Brennan but it may not be the case. We won't know that until we get closer to the oral argument. And as soon as I know, I will tell you and tell you my predictions as to what it means. So for the sake of argument, let us assume that the three judge panel is Frank Easterbrook, Diane Wood, and Michael Brennan. Let me be very clear. Judge Diane Wood is going to rule against the second amendment. That is a no brainer. She is one of the most, she's, she's older now. I think she's a senior judge. Um, but at one point, she had a very bright future as a federal judge. She was considered a shortlister for the United States Supreme Court among Democratic presidents. Uh, she is, in my view, very outcome-oriented uh, for the left. So we're going to definitely lose Diane Wood. If you see Diane Wood on the panel, we're going to lose that no matter what. We will lose her vote. That's my best guess. If we have Frank Easterbrook and Michael Brennan, Michael Brennan is a judge I don't know a lot about. He was appointed to the federal bench by President Trump, so he doesn't have a robust record on the Second Amendment, so it's hard to know. But assuming for the sake of argument that he rules in favor of the Second Amendment, just for the sake of argument, for our hypothetical here, that would be Diane Wood would be ruling against us, and then Michael Brennan is ruling for us. That's one-to-one, -one, which means the tie-breaking vote on a three-judge panel would be Frank Easterbrook. Now, Frank Easterbrook, Judge Easterbrook is terrible on the Second Amendment. That is no doubt that is true. However, I think there's two paths he could go. And then after I tell you these two paths, I will tell you the anti-gun response to that. And you'll basically, I'm basically going to be right, I believe. We'll see. So Judge Easterbrook is either going to write a decision that says that uh, the Second Amendment is no good, that the Supreme Court screwed up Nice Surfer versus Bruin and Heller, and he's not going to follow it. And he's essentially going to politely, in legalese, thumb his nose at the U.S. Supreme Court and challenge them to take this case on cert. That is one approach that Judge Easterbrook may take. If that were the case, then we would lose that case two to one, and uh, that would then give us a clear stepping stone to the United States Supreme Court. We'll get to that in a second. Or alternatively, Frank Easterbrook could do the right thing and actually follow Supreme Court precedent, which he's supposed to do as a quote-unquote inferior judge. Inferior judge is articulated by Article Three of the U.S. Constitution. You have the Supreme Court, and then you have all other inferior courts which would include Judge Easterbrook, of course. And Judge Easterbrook could do the following. He could just follow the Supreme Court precedent, which is pretty clear in my view, and essentially apply it and say he has no choice to apply it. And even if he disagrees with it, he's going to apply it. At that case, we would win it's two to one, and the Illinois state gun laws would be struck down as unconstitutional. Now, what Judge Easterbrook, and this is going to get a little geeky, but I want to tell you that anyway, is what I think Judge Easterbrook could do, because as you know, in my view, uh, I think Judge Easterbrook thinks he should be Justice Easterbrook on the Supreme Court, and I suspect he's not super happy that he's not Justice Frank Easterbrook, and I'm glad he's not, by the way. Nevertheless, what he might do is to say that his hands are tied, come out in support of the Second Amendment, rule for us two to one, which would be, of course, uh, Judge Brennan and Judge Easterbrook would be the two, and Diane Wood would be the 
three, meaning two to one with a dissent. And then Frank Easterbrook would write the opinion and say basically that his hands are tied under the Second Amendment and under the Supreme Court precedent. And then he would write explaining why you know the Second Amendment wins. And then he might write a separate concurrence. I don't know. I could see this happening. And then he might write a separate concurrence basically complaining about why he doesn't feel the Supreme Court got it right in Heller and Bruin. And write a concurrence saying, even though I'm going to follow the law because I have no choice because I'm a lower court judge and an inferior court, I still don't like it. And write a concurrence explaining why he thinks the Supreme Court is wrong. That would be the sort of thing I would expect out of a Judge Easterbrook. Again, we don't know what's going to happen. Hopefully he doesn't go down that path, but I could certainly see something like this occurring. By the way, as a side note, before I get to what the anti-gunner strategy will be in response to these things, did you know that Joe Biden, when he was on the Senate Judiciary Committee, specifically attacked as uh, people he did not like, Judge Easterbrook and Judge Posner. In fact, I think a reason, a reason why Judge Posner and Judge Easterbrook never made it to the United States Supreme Court may in fact be because Joe Biden, uh, one of the Democrats on the Senate Judiciary Committee, specifically went public saying he did not like either of their ideology. One of the reasons why Joe Biden may have gotten this wrong, actually, here's the weird part. Joe Biden's public statement back in the day when he was in the Senate against Frank Easterbrook and, and Richard Posner, uh, both of whom come out of the University of Chicago Law School, I think the reason why Joe Biden didn't like them is because he viewed them as the next coming of a Justice Scalia. Keep in mind that Justice Scalia was at the University of Chicago Law School, Frank Easterbrook was at the University of Chicago Law School, and Judge uh, Richard Posner, who we're going to get to in a second, in another Second Amendment context, was also at the University of Chicago Law School. And I think that Joe Biden did not want Easterbrook and Posner to be another Scalia, and that may have been why he went on the public record saying he didn't like those two at all and could never support Easterbrook and Posner uh, because of their ideology, which was similar to Scalia. So strangely enough, we may have Joe Biden to thank for keeping Easterbrook and Posner off the Supreme Court, and thank God they're not on there. They're terrible on the Second Amendment, and we'll get to that in one second. Okay, so here's where we are right now. We have the three-judge panel. We're assuming it's Easterbrook, Wood and Brennan, the three-judge panel that just heard this case on Friday, assuming they are there at the end of June, I think, again, it goes one of two ways. Either we win two to one with Easterbrook in the majority, or we lose two to one with Easterbrook also in the majority. So I think Judge Easterbrook is going to be the deciding judge here. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Okay, so we're going to wake up at some point in August or September, and there will be this ruling from the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. We will either win the case or lose the case. So if the Second Amendment movement wins the case in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, then almost certainly some aspect of or the entire gun control law will be struck down, meaning the semi-automatic weapon ban or rifle ban in Illinois will be struck down and or the magazine ban will be struck down. That is the clearly right result. So a victory in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals will be spectacular and a great win and very exciting. And thank God we will have won for our brothers and sisters in Illinois involving their gun rights. And that will be great, great, great. But here's the thing. If we win in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, you can bet dollars to donuts that the anti-gun movement will not, will not, I repeat, will not seek certiorari to the United States Supreme Court, and why not? Because the last thing the anti-gun movement in America wants right now is for an assault weapon ban case or a magazine case to get to the United States Supreme Court because they're going to lose big time, big time, and they know it. So they're going to work hard to avoid that. So if the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals rules in favor of the Second Amendment, that will be a big win for Illinois, but that ruling will only apply to the states within the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, most specifically Illinois, okay? So will the anti-gunners take a appeal to, or seek certiorari to the Supreme Court? The answer is almost certainly no. Now there's historical precedent for this. Keep in mind, also involving the, and also involving the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals in 2013, the Second Amendment movement won in a major victory with an opinion written by Judge Richard Posner, who is also a faculty colleague of Frank Easterbrook, who is also someone that Joe Biden did not like. Now, Richard Posner generally does not like the Second Amendment, but in fairness to Richard Posner, he wrote a beautiful decision saying, I don't really support the Second Amendment or the Supreme Court's interpretation of it, but my hands are bound, and therefore I'm going to write this opinion in a case called Moore versus Madigan. I'll put a link to it down below. Moore versus Madigan. The Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals in 2013 issued a three-judge panel ruling that said that Illinois' 
ban on carrying guns outside the home was unconstitutional because it violated the Second Amendment's right to bear arms. Remember, before Nyserpa versus Bruin, we had the right to keep arms in the Heller case, but we had not established the right to bear arms allowed us to carry guns outside the home in public. That did not come at the Supreme Court level until Nyserpa versus Bruin last year. So in 2013, the fight at that moment in time in 2013 was whether or not the right to bear arms said you had a right to carry guns outside the home under the Second Amendment. Bruin had not decided, had not been decided yet. So in 2013, we win Moore versus Madigan. And then what does the anti, and this is the key, what did the anti-gunners do at that moment? They seek en banc review, which means a review from the entire Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals that is denied. So then what does they do? Well, what the anti-gun movement or the state of Illinois did in Moore versus Madigan was they asked Justice Kagan for an extension of time, as I recall, to file a request for certiorari to the Supreme Court for the Supreme Court to hear the case. But guess what happened? The anti-gunners did not, did not file a cert petition to the US Supreme Court because they feared that if they did in 2013 in Moore versus Madigan and they sought cert from the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court would issue effectively Nyserpa versus Bruin in the year of our Lord 2013 or 2014. And now that precedent of the right to bear arms across you know, outside the home under the Second Amendment would be a national precedent which all the courts in America would need to follow. So what the anti-gunners did is they strategically decided that after Moore versus Madigan, a terrible loss for them in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, they would they should basically take the loss there, allow Illinois to become a shall issue permit state, which it did, and leave it alone and take that loss and not risk getting a national loss at the Supreme Court. So the anti-gunners, despite losing in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals in 2013, did not seek cert from the Supreme Court. That was a strategic decision, by the way, why they didn't do it. And now to further reiterate how the anti-gunners think about this, a few years later in 2017, in a case called Wren, out of the DC Court of Appeals, that's in DC, the DC Court of Appeals followed the precedent of Moore versus Madigan to conclude that the right to bear arms includes the right to carry guns outside the home and that the District of Columbia's ban on carrying guns outside the home was unconstitutional under the Second Amendment in a case, again, called Wren versus the District of Columbia. And Wren relied upon the precedent of Moore versus Madigan. So what did the anti-gunners do after the Wren decision was decided by the D.C. Court of Appeals? Did they seek cert from the Supreme Court? No, they didn't. So in 2017, the Wren case is decided, striking down D.C.'s you know, ban on the carrying of handguns in DC, using the Second Amendment's right to bear arms, and the anti-gunners, again, did not seek cert in the Wren case, despite clear conflict of laws, despite clear circuit conflicts, because other courts like the Ninth Circuit, I believe, and the Second Circuit had already said, there's no, I think the Third Circuit had already said there was no right to carry guns outside the home, so you had a clear circuit split, and yet the anti-gun movement did not seek cert either in 2013 in, from the Seventh Circuit and more, and they did not seek certiorari to the Supreme Court in 2017 from the Wren case, and why didn't they do it? They lost, right? Of course we know why they didn't do it, because they feared that if they took that appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court, the Supreme Court would declare what they ultimately did in Bruin in 2022, that the right to bear arms was a national precedent that everyone had to comply with, and not just the jurisdictions of D.C. and Wren and the seven circuit states and more. And now, so what does all this mean when it comes to the Illinois case? In my view, in my prediction, if the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals rules against us, on the so-called assault weapon ban and the magazine ban. If it rules against the Second Amendment community, then the Second Amendment lawyers will be able to seek certiorari and will almost certainly seek certiorari from the United States Supreme Court. And there's an excellent chance that the US Supreme Court would take that case and settle these gun ban cases once and for all, How, which would be great. But we would have to lose in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals first before that could occur. If we win in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, that will be awesome and a great victory in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. But if that happens, then I suspect the anti-gun movement will do exactly what they do strategically in the Moore case dealing with carrying firearms and the Wren case dealing with firearms in 2017. And they will choose not to seek certiorari, fearing that the US Supreme Court will, will, will crush them. And again, as you know, the Supreme Court can't reach out and take cases. They can only take cases that come to them. That's why they're the least dangerous branch, so to speak, is they can't act 
without people of first bringing cases to them. If cases never get to them, they can't do anything about it. Okay, folks, uh, hope you learned a little bit something here today. Hope it wasn't too geeky about some of this process. If you haven't subscribed, uh, please do so. And don't forget to check us out on Twitter at Four Boxes Diner. And uh, we'll see you again soon here at the Four Boxes Diner. Orders up. Table 2A.